so this morning uh, we'll be in Psalm 19, and uh, the title of the message is The Glory of God in Creation and um, in His Word. And, uh, you know, before we get into the, into the study, let me go ahead and open up in prayer, and then we'll look at this uh, together. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning and just for this wonderful time of worship. We thank you for the opportunity to come here together and to just worship you and to hear from you. We pray that you fill this place, fill us, Lord, with the power and the person of your Holy Spirit. Give us understanding, Lord, of your word. And I pray, Lord God, that whatever comes forth, Lord God, that it's of your spirit, Lord God. And I pray that we leave different from how we come in here or how we came in here this morning. We thank you once again for your love, for your compassion, for your mercies, for the privilege of knowing you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so this morning, I, um, I'm blessed, I'm humbled to be up here. I'm usually in the back somewhere with the youth or, or you know, helping out. Uh, but it's a privilege to be up here teaching, um, specifically through Psalm 19. And this is actually a psalm that C.S. Lewis once described to be the greatest poem in the Psalter or the Book of Psalms and one of the greatest lyrics um, in the world. And uh, for me personally, Psalm 19 is a very precious psalm. It's a beautiful psalm, and it just has a lot of meaning uh, for me. Many of the things we have declared here in Psalm 19 have really, really been on my heart over the past few weeks, really the past few months. On Wednesdays, you know, we've been gathering here with the men, um, and we've been going through the book of Genesis, and we've been talking about the glory of God through his his creation as we've gone through those first few chapters. And then, of course, in the youth group, we've been going through the gospel of Luke, and we've been talking about the glory of God through his word as we've been reading about his earthly ministry when Jesus was physically on this earth, and he was sharing the many parables and the stories and the lessons, and uh, that's just been a really blessed time. And I believe Psalm 19 brings all of those things um, together here. And I'm so grateful for, for King David for writing this psalm, putting this psalm together for us. And what's interesting to me about King David is that he wrote this psalm along with many others, um, kind of like with only a fraction of God's word, right? At that time, the completion of the canon of scripture hadn't been um, established, right? The entire Bible hadn't been written out yet. And yet he wrote these psalms and, and all these things with just beautiful descriptions of the Lord, his beauty and his, his splendor. And for us in this room this morning, we're greatly blessed because we have the completion of canon, right? We have the entirety of God's word. There's nothing missing. It's all here. And we know that the Lord is perhaps more glorious than maybe King David even thought at that time. But because the word of God is inspired by him, we know that King David wrote exactly what the Lord desired him to write for us to read this morning. Um, so before we actually get into the text verse by verse, um, I'm going to go ahead and read the entire um, psalm, and then we'll look at this uh, one verse at a time or a few verses at a time. All right, so Psalm 19. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the expanse proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour out speech. Night after night, they communicate knowledge. There is no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard. Their message has gone out to the whole earth and their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, he has pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming from his home. It rejoices like an athlete running a course. It rises from one end of the heavens and circles to their other end. Nothing is hidden from the heat or from its heat. The instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. 
They are more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey, dripping from a honeycomb. In addition, your servant is warned by them, and in keeping them, there is an abundance reward. Who perceives an un his unintentional sins? Cleanse me from my hidden faults. Moreover, keep your servant from willful sins. Do not let them rule, do not let them rule me. Then I will be blameless and cleansed from blatant rebellion. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So the first thing we're going to look at this morning, our first point, is God's glory through creation. And that will be like the first uh, six verses, but I'm going to break it down into two pieces. So the first four verses up to the, you know, the first part of verse four, and I'll read it again before I talk about it. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the expanse proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour out speech. Night after night, they communicate knowledge. There is no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard. Their message has gone out to the whole earth and their words to the ends, <clears throat> excuse me, of the world. As you can imagine, these verses are, um, they're just so beautiful and so meaningful to me, first and foremost, as a follower of Jesus Christ, and secondly, as an atmospheric scientist. So I studied the atmosphere for a very long time. Um, I was trained um, at, at different universities, and I'll talk a little bit about that in just a little bit here. But here, King David is speaking of the glory of God in the heavens, and it says here, in the expanse, and I think in some um, translations, it talks about his firmament. Whatever it says, it's re referring to his handiwork, the things he did with his very hands. So we're going to first talk about this term heavens that is used here. And when you think about the term heavens in the word of God, there are clues that point to the existence of three heavens. And before you run out of the room, let me explain that through scripture. Okay. The term third heaven is actually presented and described, for example, by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. And in there, remember, Paul is beginning to speak about his sufficiency in the Lord, and he was boasting in that sufficiency. So he says here, uh, beginning in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, boasting is necessary. It is not profitable, but I will move on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether he was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. I know that this man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. Was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which a human being is not allowed to speak. I will boast about this person, but not about myself, except of my weaknesses. So what we can draw from this portion of scripture is this place that Paul refers to as the third heaven. This is the place where the Lord is right now, seated at the right hand of the Father, where our loved ones are right now that have gone before us, right? Because the word of God tells us to be absent from the body is to be in the presence of the Lord. So that is the third heaven there. And in fact, the author of Hebrews further supports this in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26, where it says, for this kind of high priest we need, speaking of Jesus Christ, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. So once again, this heaven, this, this third heaven that Paul is talking about here is a place that we cannot experience right now in these bodies, the way that we are now, right? It, this is a place that we will experience once we see the Lord face um, to face. Now, if you, if you read more about this, and I encourage you to, um, you know, some people suggest, some scholars suggest that this person that Paul was boasting about was actually himself. 
I don't know if you remember back in the book of Acts that you know, he, he was stoned there in Lystra and perhaps he had this out-of-body experience and had this vision of the third heaven. I don't know. Only God knows. But what we can conclude from this portion of scripture is this existence of the third heaven. Um, so now, because of this, this suggests that there is likely another first and a second heaven. And what are these other, these other two heavens? Well, I believe that the first heaven being described here, and also in Psalm 104, verse 12, for example, if you look there, it speaks of the birds of the heavens or the sky, depending on your translation. And we know from experience that birds, you know, they fly around, they're close to the earth's surface, they're flying around in the atmosphere, is what it is. So that first heaven, you can think of that thin layer of fluid, the atmosphere that surrounds the entire planet. Okay, that would be um, the first heaven, that layer that's protecting us from the radiation from the sun. That's where all the weather is. It's keeping us um, safe at night, right? We, we don't die at night because the earth doesn't cool off um, so dramatically because of that thin layer surrounding us. The second heaven um, is where we find, as Isaiah 13.10 puts it, the stars of heaven and their constellations. And this is a reference to outer space, where the planets live, where the stars live. So notice here in Psalm 19, you know, what heavens is, is he speaking of here in Psalm 19? Well, notice that David uses the word heavens, but he also uses the word expanse, okay? And where have we heard the word expanse before? Well, on Wednesdays, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we've been gathering, um, the men have been gathering, we've been going through the book of Genesis. And that word expanse here is the same Hebrew word that's used in Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. And there, um, Moses uh, uh, records for us, I believe, then God said, let there be an expanse between the waters, separating water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above the expanse. And it was so. God called the expanse um, sky. Evening came and then morning and that was the second day. So that's there speaking of the second day of creation, right? The first day, of course, remember, the Lord created light. And here, it's speaking of this expanse, separating the water from the earth, from the water that's in the air. You think about um, water vapor in the air, or water um, in the form um, of a gas. So that's what is being um, described here with the word um, expanse. So what is suggested here is that David is describing God's glory as seen in the blue sky, in the clouds, in the constellations, in the stars, all of these things that we see on a daily basis. These are the things that he's describing. And I want you to think about that for a moment. When you are out and about at night and you, maybe you, you get away from the city where there's not so much light pollution, but you go out like in the middle of the desert, you look up to the sky and you see the stars, you see the moon, you see, you know, you can see Venus. It's a small little dot. You really can't tell the difference between Venus and another star. And it was last year, if you remember, that conjunction between, I think it was Venus and Saturn that created that Christmas star right around December 22nd last year. Um, and when you look up and see those things, what do, you, what do you think about? Do you think about the glory of God? We should. We should be in awe because he created those things to remind us of who he is. Um, so that is what we're seeing here being described, right? All of this should declare God's, um, God's glory. Now, if you look at the second verse into that first part of verse four, it says, day after day, they pour out speech. Night after night, they communicate knowledge. There is no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard. Their message has gone out to the whole earth and their words to the ends um, of the world. So notice here that the sky, whether it's day or nighttime, um, they speak to us. They don't say words to us, but the sky, it reveals knowledge about the glory and the wisdom and the creativity of the Lord, his greatness. 
And the glory of God is visible for everyone to see regardless of where you are on this planet. It doesn't matter your skin color. It doesn't matter your age or your political affiliation. The sky speaks to us. It speaks of the glory of the Lord. And in fact, Paul writes in Romans 1.20, it says, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. And I love that because we have no excuse. We see him around us. He never leaves us. And this is so true. I love this verse because for me, um, when, when, I was, when I was working as a scientist, the more I studied creation, the more the creator was revealed to me, the more I was in awe of him. And I went from... Um, I went from a, a, a doctor of philosophy PhD to a praying heaven down PhD because of what the Lord did. Just seeing him in creation, studying him in creation. Instead of worshiping the creation, I started to worship the creator. And God is so good. And I'll talk more about this maybe at another time. But, um, but God does this. We get to know him more through his creation. If you look at the next few verses here, um, we'll look at verse 4b, the second part of verse 4, and then we'll work into verse 6. It says, In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming from his home. It rejoices like an athlete running a course. It rises from one end of the heavens and circles to their other end. Nothing is hidden um, from its heat. So, and this is, this is beautiful to me too. Um, and, you know, I think Pastor Angel was talking about this a few weeks ago. You know, have you ever taken time to see the sunrise and the sunset? And, you know, here David is focusing now on the sun, this created um, entity that lives in the heavens. And when you think about the sun, here he's comparing it to a bridegroom or to an athlete, Right. And when you look at the sun rising, and, you know, I know here in El Paso, it's, it's all about perspective. You know, we have this, this huge piece of, you know, granite cutting the city in half, right? You got the Franklin Mountains. So if you're on the east side of the mountains, you see a beautiful sunrise from the horizon, um, and then it sets behind the mountains. But if, if you live on the western side of town, you see the sun rising behind the Franklin Mountains, but then you see a beautiful sunset on the other side, right, where the horizon is. So you see this really cool, you know, arc or trajectory that the sun sets from the east to the west. It has this cycle. And the Lord here, through David, is comparing it to a, bride, a bridegroom, rather, and an athlete that is, is running his race. And we have some good athletes in here, some good runners in here. So um, just like the sun, right, we, we run that chorus, we run that trajectory, um, and that's what the sun does. And once again, for all to see, there's nowhere, unless you're in the ground, of course, or in a cave, um, where you don't see the sun, right? Um, so notice here that he also says that not even the depths, right? Um, or nothing is hidden from the sun, rather, is what I'm trying to say here. He says this here in that second part um, of verse 5, right? Uh, it's actually the last part of verse 6, where it says, nothing is hidden from its heat. And we know that, right? Nothing is hidden from the sun's heat. Um, if, you, if you're new to the area or maybe you've lived here your entire life, um, June and July are, are very unpleasant because of the heat of the sun. Um, and uh, we, we, you can't hide from it. I mean, you can go inside and, and turn on your air conditioning. But when you're outdoors, the, the heat of the sun, you can't hide from it. And, um, and it's true when I, I was thinking about this because even in the ground, all the heat that's heating the earth, it, it makes its way into the ground. So absolutely nothing is hidden from the Lord's heat. And it kind of reminds me of what the author of Hebrews tells us, where he says that nothing um, will be hidden from the Lord, like everything will be exposed. And that's, that's very symbolic of what we see um, with the sun. And uh, I don't know, it's just awesome. We're in awe of the Lord and, and what he has created and what he's done uh, through this creation. So in the next several verses, um, and we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time in these next several verses, we're going to see a shift here where now we're going to look at the glory of God in his word. Okay, the glory of God in his word. 
And this is verses 7 um, through 14. And if you look at verses 7 through 9, what we're going to see here is the character of God's word being described. Okay, so it says, The instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. And then it says the ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether uh, righteous. So the first thing we see here is that the instruction of the Lord, it's perfect, isn't it? It's renewing one's life. And once again, David transitions here from praising the Lord in creation to the Lord revealing himself through his word. And this book here, the word of God, it is inspired by the Lord and it has no error in it. Um, it's also the number one selling book in the world, if you, if you didn't know that. Um, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture, the word of God, which you are holding in your hands, um, is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. And then notice it also says here, um, it talks about the fact that the word will never pass away, right? The word of God will never go away. Matthew 24, 35, remember, heaven and earth will pass away. These are the Lord's words. But my words will never pass away. Uh, Psalm 119, 89, Lord, your word is forever. It is fixed in heaven. And I love that. Another thing that we can confide in, in the word of God, is the fact that God's word is inexhaustible. Every time we get into God's word, even if you've read this, that, that portion of scripture like a thousand times, God's word always has something for us. So whether your marriage is falling apart, whether you're going through a season where you're sick, you're going through a season where you just have no idea what the Lord's doing, um, God's word will always have something for us. And we can, we can just appreciate that. Get into the word, and he has something for us, for that situation. God knows exactly what we need. And just like the Lord, because the word of God is God, John 1.1 1, 1 tells us, he is the same, which means the word is the same, yesterday, today, and forever. And that's the same um, for the word of God. And as believers, we know the renewing power of the word of God. You know, when we get into the word, it gives us hope. It gives us an anchor, and we can confide in it. But even more so, we know that God's word has that renewing power in the sense that it has made us born again because of the faith that we've put into his word. And that's a beautiful thing because when you allow the Lord to come into your life through his word and through the power and the person of the Holy Spirit, he can go into your life and clean the filth out of your heart, and come in, and rule, and lead you in the way he desires to lead you. And suddenly, our goals, our desires, our motives, our plans, they become so irrelevant, and then suddenly his plans, his motives, his goals, they become the very center of our existence. And that's where peace is found, the peace that surpasses all understanding. And to be there, it can be a hard it can be a hard thing to get there, but once you're there, um, you can have the peace. It doesn't matter what you're going through in this life. God will give you the peace that you need to get through it. He's so good, and I love him so much for that. And I think a lot of us in this room can attest to that. So now in the Lord, I know for me, my life has purpose. It has a plan because it's the Lord's plan. It's the Lord's purpose. I don't have to worry about that. Even when I find myself in a season where I have no idea what the Lord's doing, I can just trust him. And I know I'm telling you guys these things, and it's easier said than done. I know. It's easier said than done. But the Lord will always give us everything to remain faithful to what he's called us to do. And if we try to get away from that, you try to go away from the Lord, he will pull you in like a magnetic field, right? Through the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we can't get away from this. 
we, we, once you're in the Lord, once you taste and you see the goodness of the Lord, there's no turning back. Now, this renewing power of the Lord, it's available to everyone. Paul talks about this in Romans 10, 13. There he says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And you ask yourself, well, how do we receive this? Well, we need to put our faith in that gospel message, right? What is that gospel message? Well, it's that message that to the world seems so simple, but to us is so powerful, right? Number one, that Jesus died for our sins. Number two, that Jesus was buried. And then number three, that Jesus rose from the dead three days later. When we wholeheartedly declare that message and put our faith in that message, there is an element of repentance in our life. There's a change in our life. That makes us born again. John 3.3 3 tells us. It also makes us righteous in the sight of God. Romans 3.22 speaks of this. right? Renewing our lives from death to life because we know that the wages of sin is death. And in fact, Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. He says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Um, the old has passed away, and see, the new um, has come. And I can confidently say that in Christ Jesus, the best is still yet to come. And we have to hold fast to the Lord. And then notice here that the word of God the testimony, it says, speaking of the word of God, the testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The inexperienced wise. So we know that the word of God can be trusted because it was inspired by him. There is no error in the word of God. But also notice that it says that it makes the inexperienced wise. And I think in the New King uh, James translation, it talks about making wise the simple. If you're, if you're reading from that translation. Um, and this reminds me of what the Apostle Paul tells us in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. There he says, Brothers and sisters, consider your calling. Not many were wise from a human perspective, but many powerful. Not many of noble birth. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise and God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world, what is viewed as nothing, to bring to nothing what is viewed as something, so that no one may boast in his presence. It is from him that you are in Christ Jesus, or in Christ Jesus, yes, who became wisdom from God for us, our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. So that's one thing we have to remember as believers. That for all of us in Christ Jesus, you know, we've, we've been made simple in him. And every single day as we get into his word, we're becoming wiser and wiser. Because we're looking more and more like Jesus as we apply that word into our lives. And we'll talk a little bit about that in these latter verses here. But because of this, as we get into his word, we become wiser. Um, we have a responsibility to get into God's word. We can't just depend on our pastors, on our leaders to feed us on Sundays and on Wednesdays. We have to take that initi initiative because if you don't eat, what happens to you? You die. And if you don't feed yourself spiritually, you're going to die spiritually. I always, I always tell the young people that you need to take responsibility for your salvation. Just because your parents are in the faith doesn't mean that you are automatically in the faith. You have to be responsible to receive the Lord into your life, to get into your Bibles, to read the word, to feed yourself. Because if you don't, you're going to dry up and the flesh is going to overtake the spirit, right? It's this constant battle between the flesh and the spirit. And we don't want to die. Our responsibility is to get into the word of God, to protect what the Lord has given to us. That way we can live it and share it with other people around us. So it also says here that the precepts, um, yes, of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. And when we know the word of God and we know the God of the word, we can find joy, right? Because God is the word. John 1.1 1, 1 tells us this, um, as I mentioned earlier, his truth and in our relationship with God as he is revealed through his word, right? It's through his word that we know him, we get to see him. 
Every day that we get into his word, he becomes a little bit more clear to us because we don't see him right now face to face. We can see him in our minds and in our hearts when we get into the word, right? And as we get into the word more and more, and as we gain more knowledge about the Lord, and as we apply it into our lives, we start to look more and more like Jesus Christ. And then notice he continues and he says, the command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. So God's word, right? His word is radiant. It's pure. Um, when you think about radiant, what does that mean? Think, think about the sun, right? Going back to the sun. It's, it's just bright. It radiates. It's, it's radiant. It's, it's bright. It's shiny. That's what God's word is. It's being described here. And it, um, it, it, makes, it brings light to our, our eyes, right? It, it kind of it brings knowledge. It brings um, understanding. God's word will always bring light to the darkness. And we know this because he's done it in our own lives. And God's word will always point us to Jesus. God's word will never point us to division. It'll never point us to confusion. It'll never point us to anything that does not represent Jesus Christ. And that's where we have to be careful. Um, because sometimes the word of God gets twisted. And we, we pray that that doesn't happen here. And um, whatever comes from this pulpit has to point uh, to Jesus Christ because only he um, can save. Nothing else and no one else can save. Now, notice here it says, the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. And we know from the Proverbs that the beginning of wisdom, right, is fear is the beginning of wisdom, right? Um, And here, we know that God's word will endure. We know that it will last forever. And that's why... Our faith should be in the word of God alone. Um, And yes, you think about how the Holy Spirit can manifest healings and miracles, the different gifts of the Holy Spirit, which we believe are still occurring today. Our faith should not be solely in those things because those things will pass away. But the word of God is going to be here forever. It's going to last forever. And that's why our faith should be um, in the word of God. And then notice David closes this section off here. He says, the ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. And uh, we know that they're, that is certainly true, right? God's word is reliable and it's righteous. God's word will never let us down. God's word will never fail us like man does, right? And, and that's why we have to confide in God's word. And then notice here in verse 10 and verse 11, um, there he's going to talk about the value of, of God's word. Uh, He writes, they are more, speaking of the words of God, they are more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey, dripping from a honeycomb. In addition, your servant is warned by them, and in keeping them, there is an abundant um, reward. And of course, we know, just like David, we need to have a longing and a desire for more and more of God's word. We should desire God's word more than the most valuable thing in the world right now. In those times, gold and honey were a very prized commodity. They desired those things. But David is telling us here that the word of God is more valuable than those things. And we, once again, I I mentioned this earlier, we have the responsibility to get into God's word, seeking him. And unfortunately, a lot of times we don't make time for God's word. And what I've learned over the years is if something's important to you, you're going to make time for it. And God's word has to be important to us because all of us in this room, we are as close to God as we choose to be. And that's why we have to get into um, his word. Do it early in the morning, right when you get up, before you get your day started. That's, That's what I have to do because then the world starts to contaminate my mind and my heart and I have to get into the word That way I have the tools and the instruments to help me get through the day, in addition to the Holy Spirit and prayer and and brothers and sisters in Christ that you can rely on. Um, Now, I don't know how many of you eat honey in here. Um, I know some people are allergic to honey. I know when I eat honey, it's this just like savory, wonderful, sweet experience. And um, it's so sweet. But here David's telling us that the word of God is even sweeter than that. Um, it's even sweeter, and I was thinking about this, it's even sweeter than that sweet tea from Whataburger, which they don't sell at In-N-Out, but they have a Whataburger. Um, it's sweeter than that, 
Okay, that's what the word of God is. I mean, it doesn't talk about that, but it's just, it's very sweet if you, if you can understand that. Um, and certainly when you taste and you see the goodness of the Lord, there's no turning back. Like I said, you can try, but, but he won't let you. Um, and then notice that in verse 11, David, he proceeds to give us two reasons why um, God's word is so much more valuable than these things, gold and honey. And, um, you know, notice, so before I go on, he talks about the gold being pure gold. So this is not just any gold, right? This is gold that has no dross. It has no impurities. It's just, it's pure. That's very valuable. Um, So in verse 11, he says, In addition, your servant is warned by them. And in keeping them, there is an abundant reward. So God's word will always keep us from straying off that straight and, um, and narrow path, right? That path of, of righteousness. God's word will warn us of how the wealth of this world and how the pleasures of this world will destroy our lives. And notice too that God's word will always provide blessings to us. But those blessings can only come when we apply the word of God to our lives and that word becomes a part of our lives. That's when the blessings pour out. And uh, this reminds me of, um, and we were talking about this in the youth group a few weeks ago. There in the gospel of Luke in chapter 11, um, there Jesus is like in the midst of his earthly ministry. He's on fire. He's, he's preaching parables. He's preaching teachings. He's making a lot of people angry. He has a lot of followers. You can imagine what that would look like on social media nowadays, right? Um, but anyways, Jesus is there. He's preaching. And then there in Luke 11, verse 27, a woman from the crowd shouts out, and she says, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the one who nursed you. But then Jesus says, Rather, blessed are those who hear the word of God and, and keep it. So it's not enough just to be a hearer of God's word. We need to be doers of God's word. And in fact, in the epistle of James, James talks about um, that very thing. All right, and then notice, um, and I'll, I'll read verse 12 and 13 in just a second here, but the word of God also gives us a desire for inward cleansing, for inward cleansing. And um, as we know from David, there were many instances when he needed that, right? And uh, we do as well. So it says in verse 12, it says, Who perceives his unintentional sins? Cleanse me from my hidden faults. Now, when we read God's word, when we think about God's word and just how holy and how just and how perfect God's word is, we quickly realize those hidden things in our lives, those sins that maybe we were doing that were done unintentionally, right? God's word begins to expose those things. And as God's word exposes those sins in our lives, because only God's word can do that, it gives us the opportunity to ask the Lord for forgiveness. And God is so good because he provides that forgiveness. If you look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, and I like to think of this as the Christian bar of soap. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And this is something that we have to do daily, right? We get dirty daily. I mean, think about it just on a normal basis. Um, all the dust we bring into our house and, you know, the pollen, all those things. And similarly, as, as believers, spiritually, we get dirty because we're in the world. We're in the midst of the darkness. And we have to remember, though, that every single day, we are going to fall short of God's glory. Um, Paul talks about this in Romans 3.23. And as his word exposes these shortcomings, we know, as the word of God tells us, that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. And that's because Jesus came onto this planet and he experienced everything we experienced, though he was sinless. And that way, as we come boldly to the throne of grace, he can provide that mercy um, to us. Now, we're not going to be sinless on this side of heaven, but we should desire to sinless on this side of heaven because we're not going to be perfected until we see the Lord face to face. Um, And then in verse 13, it says, Moreover, Keep your servant from willful sins. Do not let them rule me. Then I will be blameless and cleansed 
um, from Blatant Rebellion. And I love this because not only should we, should we be asking the Lord to forgive, forgive us of those sins that you know, are being exposed daily as we get into the Word of God, but we should also be asking the Lord to keep us from those sins, those habitual sins that used to be our stronghold, that the Lord would remove those desires from our lives, right? Because those things knock on the door every single day and they can take us hostage again. We have to be careful. And I know this is easier said than done. And that's why we have to guard our hearts because that's where all the problems result from. We have to guard our ears, our eyes, all of those things. And that way, those things don't infiltrate into our lives, become part of our character, become an action, and then turn into sin. And then notice here in the last verse, verse 14, um, and I love this because here we see a prayer of surrender and for purity. And uh, this verse here, when I, when I read it, um, it, it just reminded me so much. It was very reminiscent of Psalm 51. If you remember there, David's plea to the Lord as he was broken, he came to the Lord with a broken and contrite heart, right? Um, after being confronted by the prophet Nathan for his um, adultery, his act of adultery with Bathsheba and in the murder of her husband Uriah. So here it says, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So here we see David's final plea to the Lord. He asks that his speech, his way of thinking, everything about him reflect what is acceptable in the sight of the Lord. And when you think about this, it's, it's a sacrifice, right? We want our sacrifices to be acceptable in the sight of the Lord. Of course, when you think about us now in Christ Jesus, our lives are these living sacrifices, right? Paul talks about this in Romans 12, there in verse 1. It says, Therefore, brothers and sisters... In view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true uh, worship. And then lastly, he calls the Lord his rock and his redeemer. And just like David, we recognize the fact that we need a redeemer. We need a savior, and it's the Lord. And he's also our rock. He's our strength. And in God, and I always tell the young people this, we can have god fittings because of the fact that we have that rock. We have that redeemer in our lives. And we can go about our day with our confidence. All right, so in closing this morning, there are two things that we focused on. The first thing we looked at here in Psalm 19 was the glory of God as presented in creation. And then we looked at the glory of God as presented in his word. And through this, you know, David presents for us the fact that we serve a glorious God of creation and revelation and a glorious God of personal re relationship and redemption. You know, Pastor Chuck used to always say, wisdom is knowing what to do with what you know. And with everything we talked about this morning, I believe that everything boils down to these two verses. And I'll close with this. Psalm 119, 160 says, The entirety of your word is truth. Each of your righteous judgments endures forever. And then Romans 1, 20 says, Forever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. So let us continue seeking the Lord, his glory through his creation and through his word, because he is our only hope and time is running out. Amen. Amen. So this morning, um, if you're here in person or maybe you're watching via the live stream or maybe you come across this video at a later time and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you haven't declared him as your Lord and Savior. I want to give you that opportunity um, this morning. And um, if that's you in here, or maybe you're watching via the live stream, um, if you could just close your eyes, um, bow your head, and uh, repeat this prayer with me. Well, Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning, Lord, asking you to come into my life to be my Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you were buried 
And I believe that you rose from the dead three days later. I, I recognize that I am a sinner and in need of a redeemer, a savior. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and use me for your glory. Amen. If you prayed that this morning, we want to welcome you to the family of Christ. And, um, you know, the word of God says that I can assure you that there are angels celebrating um, on your behalf this morning. And if you're watching via the live stream and you just want more information, maybe your next steps in this new walk with the Lord, um, please, you can leave a comment. You can call the church, leave a message or come visit us. We meet on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. here at the intersection of um, Hondu Pass and Gateway South. And um, if you're watching via the live stream, I want to thank you so much for spending some time this morning worshiping the Lord with us and just hearing from him uh, through his word. We love you and we're praying for you and we hope to see you again soon.